asked my network of friends to tell me what images come to mind when you see or hear the word university. I want you to close your eyes for a moment and just uh, hold that image in your mind. You can open them. So this is the cloud of responses that I received. You could raise your hand if you see your image up there, the word. Yes. The size of the font correlates to the frequency of responses I received. And it was very interesting to see that people's imaginary about what a university is, is really grounded in this combination of the campus, the buildings, the people. They talk a lot about the ivy, the green spaces, the quads. They talk a bit about the classrooms. They talk very little about the learning, about the excellence about the exchanges. And it's very striking that the university has become about this physical place. And if we search for university in Google and look at the images that come up, what we see there definitely correlates with that mapping of our imaginary. And I really started to wonder, when did the university become about this physical place? When did it, as a Chronicle of Education article last year stated, become more important for a student how much of a country club their campus is and not how many innovations and in pedagogy are happening? If we look back at the historical definitions for universities, and we heard earlier tonight, university was originally coined as a term to mean community. And later, in the latter part of the 14th century, it really started to define or bring together this idea of a community of scholars. And I think that many of us who are professors and hopefully many of the students would really think that that's a wonderful aspiration, to think that our universities are places where we commune and exchange, where we teach and learn. If we fast forward 100 years, the definition in the dictionary is that it's an educational institution with undergraduate and graduate colleges. So already the definition is imposing the structure of how the university is constituted. And then just this past week, if we look online, the university now has this function of granting degrees. So we moved away from the community of scholars, we pass through the, how the, it's structured, and we move into this function. And we kind of have this spectrum, and I think that with the crisis of student debt and the cost of education and these very important conversations that are happening, it's not only now sufficient to grant degrees, but to make sure that the degrees we're granting are ensuring jobs for those graduates. And I wonder, where is the best place to make sure that our graduates are getting the jobs? Is it really to focus on very vocationally driven degrees and very uh, pragmatic uh, learning? Or is it really perhaps in the communities where we can really advance that kind of learning that will not only make sure that our graduates can get a job, but can get multiple jobs and can grow into multiple kinds of careers and professions that they may not even have imagined right now at the age of 17 or 18 when they picked their undergraduate degree. So if we're going to move into these communities, is the classroom space the best place to do that? Is this really the place where a community of scholars is going to come together and fruitfully and uh, very in engaging ways exchange their teaching and learning? Or should we go out into the city? I'm a founding member of Occupy University in New York City, and we've participated in Free University where we're thinking about what happens to teaching and learning if it's free and if it's congregating in public space. This is a conversation about horizontal pedagogy. Here's our colleague Brony talking about uh, algebra, all meeting in Madison Square Park. And my colleague and friend Matthew teaches a class called Critical Walking which is not about a seminar in urbanism that meets in a classroom space, but it's a conversation about cities, the economics, the politics, the sociology, as he is walking with students through New York City's five boroughs. Since 2004 at Parsons and the New School, I've been involved in several community-engaged projects. And most recently in this uh, research project called DEED, where we've been supporting artisans, uh, traveling with students, and supporting artisans in generating income through their craft. And so what I want to talk to you about is not necessarily why we want to do that. I think you're very familiar with the statistics about wealth inequity, the inequities around race and class in terms of who has access to higher education, the fact that 90% of the world doesn't have access to their basic needs. But instead, I want to spend some time telling you about the things that our students learn while we're engaged working with communities in these fieldwork experiences that I don't think are necessarily planned for. They're not learning outcomes found in syllabi. 
They're not necessarily in the rubrics that we put together for accreditation. And perhaps they're not necessarily things that we can so easily learn in the classroom. Difference is a wonderful and problematic word that comes up when we talk about working with communities. The fact that we have this term community means that there is an other outside of ourselves. Unless, of course, we're talking about the community within the university. And so this us versus them is very problematic when we think about community development work. But what is beautiful about these experiences is that over and over again, I see how students realize that there isn't that much difference between them as a human, not just as a student, access to education, et cetera, but just at a basic human level. And this was beautifully captured by the student, Dominique, when we returned from our trip last year to uh, Colombia. This is a photo of her on her first day in Bogota. And Dominique was reflecting on the wonderful uh, connection that she felt as an African-American woman in a place that had tremendous indigenous and diverse histories. And that connection really surpassed what she had imagined she would be experiencing there. Something that we've been talking about quite a bit, empathy. I do not believe that one can sustain positive change with and in communities without having true empathy. Romelia is one of the artisans with whom we've been working in Guatemala. And when, we, when our students led this time valuation workshop, where each of us were asked to show a day in our life, a typical schedule of our day, Romelia's day starts at 5 AM, and it ends at 10 PM. And what was very striking for us is that while our schedules had the privilege of choice, I'm going to catch up with my mom on the phone, I'm going to go to a movie, I'm going to read a book, I'm going to take a nap, I'm going to go to a TEDx event, go to a lecture, Romelia's day was full of the things that she had to do just to get by for that day, to make sure that her daughters had something to eat, and make sure that she was making enough money to hopefully be able to one day send them to college. We all strive uh, in universities to say that we're educating the leaders of the next generation in whatever field they may be studying. But how often do we allow students to really lead how they are learning? to really lead the work that they're focusing on. This was a, a project that we were doing in Dominican Republic. It was a, a bilingual cultural magazine for the city of La Romana, uh, which is the third largest city there. And there was this wonderful moment where uh, the faculty were told by the students, we're going to self-organize. Two of our classmates, Evan and Christina, are going to be our project leaders. We will let you know when we, when we want you to come back to the classroom. And what was wonderful about this is that this engagement in a real project had transcended the fact that it was an assignment, that it was an academic exercise. The students really wanted to take ownership of it. And as a professor, what's uh, interesting and challenging is to leave your ego aside and to be OK with shifting from a, an educator, the holder of expert, to a facilitator, really empowering the students uh, in their own learning. Resourcefulness is certainly something that we pick up a lot working with uh, communities that perhaps have uh, less access to many of the things that we have access to. Um, also in, in Guatemala, our students were redesigning the artisan store. They had three days to do it. They had a very small budget. They didn't have a big box store where they could buy all the tools, supplies, endless options of paint color that they were used to. And what was beautiful about this, not, not just that they accomplished the project, that it was very nicely designed, but that this student, Jeremy, also perfected his hand painting sign skills, because that is how the signs in this town are painted in Guatemala. And he was able to study with a master painter um, there. And finally, and most importantly, a sense of self. I've never seen this on any syllabus, but it is over and over again that students will share that our fieldwork experiences are some of the most transformative moments in their college education. Lindsay will be graduating this spring from our History of Decorative Arts and Design program. Very little to do with what we were discussing in class and what we were discussing in the fieldwork. And yet she shared with me that this is probably the most valuable learning opportunity she had while she was in graduate school. So we're very used to how these exchanges happen in the classroom. right? There's, there's already a model set in place. There are hundreds of years of exchanges, of facilitation, of teaching, of learning. Doing this in the field is less explored. 
So I want to share with you the seven rules of field work that we have come up with and encourage those of you who are interested in this kind of work to also start to draft your own rules. I think they really need to be adapted to the projects. These have been drafted throughout the years in collaboration with the faculty and every time we travel with a new group of students, we go over the rules and figure out if we need to add or remove any of them. So the first one, very uh, pertinent to our project where we're working with artisans, is no monetary exchange. At the beginning, we were running these very highly participatory workshops. And at the end, before returning to New York, we would buy out all of the products that these artisans had made, these beautiful woven, woven goods. And we found very quickly and we learned very quickly that by doing that, we would again distance ourselves from collaborators and shift into the role of the tourist coming with the money. And it was compromising that relationship of having an equal and mutual exchange. The second one, we have a tendency to want to make promises. We become enamored with the people with whom we're working and we really want to be there to support them. And yet, particularly with international work, we're so dependent on funding it became critical across the board for students and faculty to not be able to make promises of returning or not. And with a commitment of our own to make sure that we would return and continue to support the work, just not being able to exchange that. The third one is really an internal rule for our team. We work with students from a variety of disciplines, from management to design, um, undergraduate and graduate. We mix them all together. It's very intensive. They get a lot from it, but they also go through um, a, lot of, a lot of intensity, a lot of emotions. So we had to establish this rule, no gossip. And at the end of the day, of each day in our field work, we have these open debriefing sessions where trust and communication are the most important things that we're emphasizing. The, four one, the fourth one, it doesn't matter what kind of project you're working on, a reminder that it's not just about the project on which you're working, but that the entire context in which you find yourselves, the little things that may seem insignificant end up really influencing either the empathy part or perhaps an understanding for the next iteration of the project. Observer and observed, no images here, because the idea is that when you enter in a community project, stay away from quickly documenting the entire work. If we are the ones walking in with the cameras, against, again, we're putting that barrier of we are the ones behind the camera documenting uh, the community. So really trying to create that two-way exchange. We don't use the word help in the prep course that we do in the spring semester leading up to the field work. We really ban this word. And for two reasons. One, because help is a unidirectional word. I assume that you need or want my help and I will give it to you. And the second one is because if you can't use the word help, it forces you to really find the adjectives and the verbs that truly represent the kind of exchange that you want to have about what is, what is really the project about. It's not about helping, but what is it at a very deep level. And finally, we commit to horizontality, both in how we teach our prep course with horizontal pedagogical methods, as well as how we run the community projects where we ensure that there's enough time for a mutual exchange, that if we're teaching workshops, that the community also teach us whatever expertise they may have according to uh, to you know, to what what kind of community it may be. So those are the the seven rules that we use, and again, they can be adapted to a variety of contexts. Some of these wouldn't be uh, necessarily relevant to to some other contexts. So back to classrooms. Am I saying we should get rid of all classrooms? This is really a provocation. What happens if we leave the classroom? If we go back into the classroom, I think one of the modes of teaching that is most under scrutiny is the lecture. And so I love this image from 1913, where a group of blind adults were being given a lecture. And it describes there in the caption that at the end, they were invited to walk up and feel the skeleton. And it's a really beautiful moment of a lecture switching into experiential learning. So it's not just disseminating information, but ensuring that there's an active engagement from the audience who was there, the, the, the students. If not, we may end up with this. <laughs> The disengaged student who doesn't realize class has ended, the professor who leaves without caring that the student is sleeping, and would this student be better off staying at home and watching one of these many videos that may be available online? How can we really transform 
the kinds of things that we do in the classroom to bring value back into why there are classrooms. So we shouldn't just assume that they're there, but we should really take advantage of the fact that they are private, quiet spaces, they're safe environments. There's an assumption that we're there because we want to be there. So there are all these ingredients that make for a very fruitful exchange, and I don't think that everyone, students and, and professors alike, really take advantage of that. So just to end, I want to return to where we started, which was the imaginary of the university. And I want to encourage all of us here, clearly we have some interest in redesigning education, to together really start to push the boundaries of how people imagine universities, to really start to bring other images to mind when people think about university, and to really open up the university and leave those classrooms behind. Thank you very much.